Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, Brother Mark was on the schedule to go this evening, and he is under the weather, and that is perfectly fine. Uh, so thankful for Brother Brock and his words. Uh, I don't know about all of you, but uh, when I came here for the first time and I saw What Say Ye, I thought it was one of the most inspiring things that I had ever seen traveling around to see uh, men uh, testing themselves and uh, really, I mean, testing their courage. And we can certainly see individuals' growth from that. Uh, we understand that we all have different talents and abilities, but to stretch ourselves is certainly something that's never easy. I heard someone define courage this way one time. Uh, courage is not the absence of fear, but the understanding that some things are more important than your fear. And much of that is the Christian life. You know, it's not the absence of fear. It's not the absence of concerns, uh, uh, but certainly understanding that sometimes things are more important than our fears. Uh, for my talk, I've been working with uh, Andy Robinson. We're getting ready for singing week, and I've been designated as the chapel speaker, which means I speak uh, 30 minutes every day. And uh, I don't take that responsibility lightly when we have uh, teams across the state gathered together. But he certainly gave me some challenging topics. He gave me uh, psalms, but he said, I want psalms that are about, uh, some of them about suffering. I don't want any of them from David. And I sent him a list of psalms after I studied and I looked through, and he sent me back a list, and he took some off, and he put some of his on. And some of his, one of them we're going to discuss this evening, is Psalm 137. Psalm 137 has an unknown writer, and it is really an intense psalm. Uh, we're going through psalms about suffering and what we can learn from these psalms. And like we discussed, psalms is interesting because it's songs that are written. And many times we have figurative language in psalms, and many times we have intense emotion. And in Psalm 137, we definitely have intense emotion. Intense emotion. Let's just read it really quickly. Thankful for Corey reading those first three for us. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hung our harps upon the willows in the midst of it. For there those who carried us away captive asked us for a song. And those who plundered us requested mirth, saying, Sing us uh, one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. If I do not remember you, let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. If I do not exalt... Jerusalem above my chief joy. Remember, O Lord, against the sons of Edom, the day of uh, Jerusalem, who said, raise it, raise it to its very foundation. O daughter of Babylon, who are to be destroyed, happy the one who repays you as you have served us. Happy the one who takes and dashes your little ones against the rock. This is a very intense psalm. In the very beginning of the psalm, we already see crying, but I think what we need is we need context to see where we're at. If we remember the children of Israel come out of Egypt, and they get to the edge of the promised land, they don't believe they can take it, they wander in the wilderness for 40 years, then they take the promised land. They have their, the promised land. They have the promised land, and they, they're ruled for, with a system of judges for a period of time, and then they ask for a king, and they get their first king, King Saul. And after King Saul, we have King David. And after King David, we have King Solomon. And the kingdom is united. But after King Solomon, something happens to the kingdom of Israel. It breaks apart. It splits in half. And we have the northern and the southern kingdom. And the northern kingdom is going to turn away from God. And Assyria is going to come in and really take them into captivity. The southern kingdom is going to last a little bit longer, Judah. And they are going to last for a while, and then they're also going to turn away from God, and Babylon is going to come in and take them into captivity. So when we look at Psalm 137, what we're dealing with, I believe, is some of those captives, or a captive, of those people, the Israelites, that have been taken, and now they're at Babylon, and they are captive, and they are slaves. This is a suffering psalm. Let's look at those first three verses. It says, By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept. We remembered Zion. We hung our harps upon the willows in the midst of it. There, for there, those who carried us away captive ask us a song and have plundered uh, us and requested mercy, saying, Sing us a song of Zion. We have a picture of some of these captives there on the river of Babylon, which was surely a beautiful place. 
but not a beautiful place in their situation, being captives. We have a picture of them weeping. And certainly after war, after suffering, after being captured, being a slave, certainly weeping, we can certainly understand that idea. They're weeping and they're remembering what? They're remembering back home. They're remembering back home, and in this deep despair, they're, they're remembering, they're crying, and they're getting to a point where, look at verse 2, it says they hang their harps up. It's almost like this idea that they're giving up music. They're giving up song in their dark despair. You know, certainly you think about that. You think of this crying, you think of this situation, you think of this idea of being in slavery, being ripped away from your home. Some of your family's probably not even around anymore. You're on the rivers of Babylon and you're crying. And not only are you crying, you're giving up your song, but perhaps why are they giving up the song? Look at verse 3. Is It's almost like the enemies are taunting them. They said, sing us a song of Zion. Sing us a song of home. Sing us a song of Jerusalem. They're captive in a foreign land. Do you think they have the heart to sing? You know, sometimes people taunt the people of the Lord. Sometimes people taunt us. Oh, you say Jesus is going to come back. Right? 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 and 4 talks about people that taunt us in such ways. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 and 4 talks there saying that scoffers will come in the last days walking according to their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? Do people taunt the people of the Lord from time to time? They taunt Christians. They say things about Christians. These people are in a hard spot. They've been ripped away from their home. They're captives on the rivers of Babylon. They're crying. They're emotional. It's almost in the situation of, of desperation. Like I said, Andy gave me a hard psalm. It's a psalm that's really in relation to suffering. These people are suffering. They're in a hard spot. It's almost hard for us to put ourselves in that situation. They're being taunted as they're suffering. Sing us a song. Sing us a song of home. You know, you think of that. That's a hard situation. And I'm going to try to take a lesson out of here. But what I want to tie into these first three verses is the idea is when we give up song, many times perhaps we've given up hope. When we have these people in the rivers of Babylon, could we say that perhaps they're in a situation where they've almost given up hope? Let's look at verses 4 through 6. It says, How shall we sing the song of the Lord in a foreign land? If I forget, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. If I do not remember you, let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. If I do not exalt Jerusalem above my chief joy. You know, there's this idea here that they want to sing. There's this idea that they don't want to forget their home. They don't want to forget their God. And they're really, you know, I mean, we're seeing the emotion that they're going through. We're seeing a lot of this. But when there is no song, I would suggest that there's no hope. And I want you to think about our singing. When we sing to each other, we think of Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16. We think about Ephesians chapter 5, verses 19 and 20, where it talks about us singing to one another. Singing is to encourage. It's to give us hope. And I can tell you that these people are in a dark place because it's a, it's a dark song. When you think about it, when we look at these individuals that are captive, they're slaves, they're laying up their harps and say, we don't know if we can sing anymore. Well, why can't you sing? Because of they're, they're almost in a situation where they feel they have no hope. You understand that singing gives us hope? I wouldn't say that I'm necessarily the most talented at singing. But you know why I sing? Because I have hope. I've been redeemed. Redeemed by the blood of a lamb. By the blood of the Lamb, I have been promised a home. We have such hope as Christians. These people are in desperation. They're in a dark place, and they're being taunted, and it's almost like this idea that they've given up song, and if we give up song, have we given up hope? I don't know about you, but singing is very powerful. When I hear brothers and sisters in Christ sing, I'd be lying to you if I haven't said I've cried. I've heard great lessons, and I'm not saying that I haven't cried after hearing some great lessons, but I can tell you that I have cried more hearing song. I remember the song that was sung at my grandma's funeral. I can't hardly sing that song sometimes. Songs are emotional. We, as human beings, have a logical side. We definitely have a logical side, but God knows we have an emotional side. And you know what helps our emotional side? Singing. Singing can help us. It can uplift us. It can encourage us. I heard a story one time, and I'm going to try to give it justice, but I probably won't. It's a story about Navy SEAL training. 
And the Navy SEALs certainly have rigorous training, some of the rigorous, rigorous training around the world, and the weeks go on in this training, and this Navy SEAL describes the training, it was one of the last weeks, and he describes the guys that are left, because they'll just let you give up if you want to give up, and he had said there was a group of guys left, and they were covered in mud, they were cold, they were exhausted, they were fatigued, and many of them were about to give up, and the officer that was over him said, if five guys give up in the next five minutes, you guys can have another meal, because a lot of times they'll restrict their meals, they won't let them eat for periods of time, they'll just give them little pieces while they're testing them through this training. He said, five people give up in the next five minutes. He said, everybody gets food. The guy describes the gentleman beside him. He said, the gentleman beside him gets up slowly, wipes the mud off his face, starts to walk to give up. All of a sudden, now the crowd of the Navy SEALs laying in the mud, one starts to sing. One of those Navy SEALs starts to sing. And then he said he watched the guy that he grabbed when he first started to get up to try to tell him not to go, and he just started walking. And when he heard that song, you know what he did? He turned around. He turned around and he came back and he sat right back down in the mud with the guys that he had been with for all those weeks building up, and he said no one gave up that day. Well, why did he not give up? Because of hope. We sing when we have hope, and we have a dark scene here in, in Psalm 137. It is a dark scene. I'm not trying to get around it. It's a dark scene. We have captives of God's people. They are on the rivers of Babylon. They are slaves. They have probably seen all kinds of atrocities. They've seen families die, families split. They've seen all kinds of things. And they said, you know what? We're being taunted. We, they've tried to take our songs away from us. We sing when we have hope. Don't let the world take your song. Don't let the world take the world's uh, God song. Let, let the world not take the praises that we sing to God. Let's look at those last few verses. These last few verses are going to fall underneath the category of impredicatory psalms, which really, these are actually pronouncing curses on enemies. And we see this throughout the book of Psalms. Okay, But I do want you to remember that these people are in an emotional place. They're going through perhaps a hard, such hard things that we'll never go through. Let's look at verses 7 to the end. It says, Remember, O Lord, against the sons of Edom, the day of Jerusalem, who did raise it, raise it to its very foundation. O daughter of Babylon, who are to be destroyed, happy the one who repays you as you have served us. Happy the one who takes and dashes your little ones against the stone. Now verse 9 is usually taken by atheists and say, What's going on? God's people are saying that babies should be killed? Well, we've got to remember where these people are in. They are in a very dark place. And to be honest with you, you're going to be in dark places in your life. Really what they're saying is, Babylon, we hope that how you treated us, you will be treated someday. Well, we think of the New Testament. We think of love our neighbor as ourself, and we think of those type of things. But you know what? Christians, even in our emotional states, have you ever said, I really want to get back at that person? We know vengeance is the Lord. We understand that. In fact, in Deuteronomy, it says that. And I think them having, the, the Psalms many times are working through emotional struggles. We have individuals that are in slavery. They're on the rivers of Babylon, and they are processing this emotionally. They're in a dark place. They're being taunted. And the, you know what they're saying? These people have done bad to us. We kind of want bad to happen to them. Now, it's easy to jump on them and say, oh, I would never say something like that. Well, we might have said something similar about someone in our lives that has done far less than what the Babylonians did to them. There is emotion in Psalms, and these individuals are processing their emotion. You know, I think of David. David, in some of his Psalms, he basically says, I'm as dirty as a dog. You know, when you're emotional, sometimes we say some things that are pretty intense. And David said some pretty intense things in his Psalms, and we see intense things throughout. But really, when it talks about this idea of happiness, I think the Babylonians were almost happy when they came in and took out Judah. They took out Israel. And I think the idea is, Babylon, your day's coming. And actually, the Bible tells us that. And actually, we have prophecies about Babylon and their fall. And guess what? It's the idea that when somebody comes in to take you out, Babylon, perhaps they're going to have the exact same attitude that you had, Babylon. They're going to be just as ruthless. It's an impredatory psalm. It's a very hard psalm. We've got people in slavery. They're, they have almost no hope. They're giving up their psalms, and they're asking curses on other individuals. Now, what I would notice is that these individuals, I think they're processing their emotion. I don't know if they really, they're not going to carry out this revenge, and they know they're in no place to carry out this revenge. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 19, if, if memory serves, it says, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And certainly we have that same idea in Deuteronomy. 
but it doesn't mean that we don't have weak moments of thought. This is an intense psalm. There's no doubt about that. It talks about the Edomites. Why are they even mentioned? Well, if we remember Obadiah, Obadiah's got one chapter, verses 10 through following. It talks about the Edomites. And whenever, which the Edomites, the descendants of Esau, Jacob, Jacob and Esau are brothers, Jacob, nation Israel, Esau, nation Edom, and when Israel is being taken over by Babylon, it seems like your brother or your cousins, they wouldn't take advantage of that situation, but they did. And that's what it says in Obadiah chapter 1, verses 10 and following. It talks about the Edomites. When Babylon shows up, it seems like the Edomites are fine with it. They show up, they pillage, they burn. And in fact, the idea is that they are actually hurting Israel all through this process. Wait, the cousins are hurting us? Yeah, that's, that's what's happening here. Families hurting us? So I think that's why the Edomites are mentioned. But this is a deep emotional moment. There's no doubt about that. But this is certainly a hard song. But what I really want to focus on is when we lose song, we lose hope. When we lose song, we lose hope. I am not the best singer. <laughs> but you know what? I sing because I have hope and I have joy. And we cannot forget that. Perhaps you remember Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16, verse 25, we find Paul and Silas. What are Paul and Silas doing in Acts chapter 16, verse 25? What are they doing? They're singing in prison. Well, how can you do such a thing? That's a dark situation. That's a bad situation. Those men could sing because they had hope. And I suggest you look throughout history is when individuals cannot sing anymore, they've lost hope. Psalm 137 is a dark psalm. Because these individuals are almost at a point where they say, well, we're thinking about giving up song. When you give up song, you have given up hope. You know, I think about that. Acts chapter 16, verse 25, we've got Paul and Silas singing in prison. Many times we talk about the others, you know. What a good example that would be for the others. But I don't know if it's just not a Navy SEAL example, <laughs> you know. Maybe Paul and Silas are encouraging one another. They're in a dark moment. They're in a dark place. They're in prison. They have taken shot after shot after shot for the cause of Christ. They're sitting in prison. Perhaps they're singing to each other. And you know what? Sometimes we need to sing to each other. You know why? So we don't give up. So we don't give up in those hard moments of life. Because I can tell you, metaphorically, you're going to be by the river of Babylon. Now you might be by the river of Babylon for different reasons. You might be by the river of Babylon because other people have sinned and that's why you're there. And that's possible why some of the Israelites are there. Because we know that the nation of Israel turned away. But there were some faithful people with Israel. You know, some of those faithful people got taken to Babylon. You might be on the rivers of Babylon because of somebody else's sin. You might be on the rivers of Babylon because of your own sin. You've done some own sin and you're in a, in a bad spot because of your own sin. And sometimes just random stuff happens to us in life. Remember in the New Testament where the tower falls. You are going to have your, Babylon, your Babylonian river moment. Where in life things are dark. Where in life it seems like everything's stacked against you. In life where there's a lot of fears, anxieties, and all kinds of things surrounding you. And what I suggest you to do in that moment is sing. Because if you can bring yourself to sing, you still have hope. As we look in Acts chapter 16 and verse 25, is that not what we see from those men? They're singing because they have hope. In one of the darkest situations they could be in, they, they sung. And I think that we as Christians cannot forget that. No matter how dark it gets, no matter how bad the situation is, even if we're by the rivers of Babylon in such a dark place, we should be able to sing to God and not be able and not forget that. Sing to God. Don't let the world take your song. Don't let the dark moments of life take away the joy and the hope that Jesus has given us in Him. Perhaps this evening you need to become a New Testament Christian. Perhaps you need the prayers of the church. We'd love to help you in any way that we can. But you think about that, the hope that Jesus gives, a hope that can have us singing in the darkest moments of life. Perhaps you need to become a New Testament Christian. Perhaps you need the prayers of the church. If you're subject to invitation, we ask you please come as we stand and as we sing.